Chuck, when we want to understand how the world works from the most fundamental physics to the nature of human consciousness, uh, scientists now like to think in hierarchies and how things work at their own level and then how they work at different levels. Can you, can you help us understand how this whole process might, might fit together and express the uniqueness of human life? Einstein once said that a symphony is very different from an air pressure curve. But a, a, a physicist would measure a symphony as an air pressure curve, as a movement of waves of pressure in air. Now, this is quite an interesting way to begin to think. If, if you were a slug, a garden slug, Mozart for you would be something like an air pressure curve. It would be vibration. Slugs, probably, I, I am not a slug specialist, <laughs> but they can detect vibrations, predators and so forth. So a slug has the ability to, to know vibrations, but not to know language, certainly not music, and not beauty, and not the kind of yearning and creativity that animated a composer like Mozart. So a slug cannot know about Mozart. For me, one of the haunting questions is, are we like slugs? Does reality keep going up? Does it have richness of new levels above us so that we're like slugs, and there's stuff like Mozart beyond us? So that, that's a funky question. <laughs> I, I love that one. But the, the hierarchy thing is, is very important because there is a tendency for scientists, there's a kind of physics imperialism, to go in the direction of nothing but, that, that which we can manipulate and understand most easily. That's what it really is. It's nothing but quarks, atoms, whatever. But actually the emergent levels, understanding the life of a slug or the creativity and consciousness of a composer, understanding language that allows us to be creative in our social interactions. These are all levels of reality, and that which we know emerges through the, the way that matter so organizes itself in these ascending levels of complexity. So take a Mozart symphony, and how would you see some of these levels working together or independently? Well, one interesting thing is, is the question of top-down causation, and it's not clear to science how top-down causation works. For us, it's trivial. We decide to pick something up, we decide and pick it up. But physics doesn't actually understand that yet. There's no proper theory of top-down causation. We know that a composer has thoughts in the composer's mind. That leads to creativity on paper, and that organizes symphonies. And at some juncture, many junctures, it moves atoms in motion in the air. So the creativity of the composer's mind is acting down all these levels through the slug uh, to the air pressure curve. And it is a trivial observation, but it's, it is actually a mystery that physics doesn't really know. The, the best subject for understanding the, the way of, of modeling nature scientifically at a base level doesn't really understand how these causes would percolate down. Some would say that what you're imagining to be this state of consciousness, this top-down causation uh, element, is really an illusion, an illusion of multiple brain systems working together in some sort of a binding uh, situation that you have the perception of unity and the I within us, but that's really uh, an illusion of our evolutionary history. This is fascinating, this illusion idea, because it's very powerfully against our common experience. Of yes. course, science does tell us that our common experience can often be wrong, mm -hmm. but it's quite fascinating. The, the way that I find that it works is that People on the psychology or neuroscience side say that the physicists require us to think this way. The, the technical term is called causal closure. That the physicists are the bosses of the scientific description of the world, and they'll tell you what the entities are and the relations, the forces between the entities. And there is no such thing as the force of mental agency. So therefore, you can't uh, include it in the world. You have to explain the world without it because the Physicists say that it ain't there. And also cons conservation of matter and energy, if you have some force that's not a physical one, mm. does that change the, the state of energy and therefore disrupt the physical law? And you, you would need an emer you, you don't want magic and ghosts. What you need is an emergentist understanding of how top-down causation works and how a mind is completely dependent on the brain but might not be reducible entirely to the brain. 
But what, interestingly, you'll find physicists are humble on these matters. Many physicists will not agree with this philosophical move of causal closure. They'll say, well, this difference between our experience and our ability to explain might be a clue towards some new way of science understanding the world more richly, more deeply. They say, Let's, can we find an, an edge into this? How can we open up a, a new field of inquiry? So the physicists are much more optimistic. It's the philosophers and the neuroscientists that right. think that the physicists have a lock on reality. It's rare that a physicist will... Uh, will claim to have a lock on reality as if there's no more physics. There's nothing, no big surprises for the future. If, if you do get a consciousness that has this top-down causality power, whatever it is, does that give some sense of, of a uniqueness uh, to those creatures that would have such consciousness? Well, it would be a property and creatures that had those properties. I had a conversation with Roger Penrose once and he he said, have you ever watched a squirrel try to get into a bird feeder? It's hard to imagine watching a squirrel try to get into a bird feeder that that, that squirrel isn't conscious in some sense. So I, I, I tend to think of consciousness as emergent. Maybe that's mine. There are technical terms here about self-reflective, mm -hmm. levels of self-reflectivity, and sometimes consciousness is reserved for that, and mind is more primitive. And does that self-reflective consciousness, is that required for the top-down causation in the, in the creation of Mozart's symphony. Well, we talked about a slug. I, th I think a slug is an agent. There, there's some interesting mysteries, uh, adventures for science at a lower level. It's not clear exactly how to describe biological agency, even for an amoeba. It's trivial to describe amoebas in, in biology, but it's not clear that we really have a theory of life in that sense. Uh, Stu Kaufman has written importantly on this. He sort of set the question. The answers haven't really come in. How do we understand from a, from a chemical point of view, a physics point of view, what an autonomous agent-like system is, a thing we call a living creature? So you would put no fine dividing line between the autonomous living creature uh, and such a creature that would have a self-reflective consciousness. It's more of a continuum than I, an absolute... I, I do think of it as a continuum, but I think there are step functions in it. Uh, things that are like the transition from a, a liquid to a gas. Mm -hmm. or a liquid phase, to a, transition. phase transitions. Consider language. Uh, we are very close to chimps. That's, that's well known. They are biologically exceedingly close to us in terms of genetics, but we're also very close to bananas genetically. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, language makes an incredibly big difference. So language is some kind of interesting emergent, and when human beings evolved this capacity, there probably was a, in time, there was probably a step function. Surely it was associated with some kind of speciation. It's such a powerful tool. Uh, and it, it, it develops very rapidly, changes the nature of intelligence, uh, community. So that would be a, an emergent step function, like a phase transition. We're almost like a different phylum <laughs> because we have language.